So he goes on to say, deluded people attach to the style and become crazy. Such cases are not rare, and it is a great mistake to teach others to practice like this. So deluded people attach to the form of meditation, attached to just sitting. They only understand sitting their body. But wise people understand to sit their mind. They sit their mind and their body. Can you sit your mind without sitting your body? Is it possible? <laughs> so this is a, uh, the way the Sixth Patriarch was teaching. And he said, it's a mistake to teach only that you, if you sit your body long enough, you will become enlightened. Some Zen masters still teach like that. They said, if you sit with me 10 years, you'll have a little taste of Kensho. You'll have a little taste of Satori. But that's not completely true. No guarantee that after 10 years, you're going to get enlightenment. You may or you may not. Very important is how you keep your mind moment to moment to moment. How clear you are in this moment. Whether you are attached or not is very important. If you're attached to something, holding something, defending something, then very difficult. Very difficult to become an awakened, enlightened sage if you're holding something, attached to something, defending something, defending some position. So always this uh, sutra talks about this. And he goes on to say, the distinction between the sudden school in Orthodox Buddhism, the distinction between the sudden school and the graduate, graduate school doesn't really exist. So the only difference is that by nature, some people are quick-witted, while others are dull in understanding. Those who are enlightened realize the truth suddenly, while those who are under delusion have to train themselves gradually. But such a difference will disappear when we know our own mind and realize our own nature. So the point is that no matter how much we describe the progress that somebody makes in meditation, it's not going to give us the complete picture. Gradual and sudden are very relative. And more important is that somebody realizes their own nature. Then, these, therefore, these terms are more apparent than real. They're more relative than real. And then the next thing he talks about here is the been the tradition of our school to take no thinking before thinking in parentheses as our teaching, no form as our substance and non-attachment as our fundamental principle. Okay? So, first of all, let's talk about what is this non-attachment. What he already we talked about non-attachment. That's what he calls the fundamental principle. Non-attachment. Don't be attached to anything. Don't be attached even if somebody says, if you, uh, if you take this position, you will have a great honor, you'll have a great prestige. Many people suffer because of that. Oh, if you run for uh, president again, you will have great prestige, you'll have great honor. Well, just recently we saw in the news this, uh, in Pakistan, this uh, previous prime minister decided again she's going to go back and become the prime minister again. And it was very dangerous. Everybody knew it was very dangerous. And the government didn't, maybe didn't really want her. And yet she went and stood up in the open crowd. Hi, right, I'm back, I'm back. And then was killed. And of course, this is a tragic thing. And, and I don't, you know, I was sad too to see that this happened. But we see that many times people, in order to promote themselves and in order to, to become something what they think is really great, will go through all kinds of, into all kinds of dangerous situations and will do many things that will uh, put them in a, in a very kind of awkward place. And here it says uh, this not attachment is the fundamental principle. So if we are seeking some kind of position, even though uh, somebody, people are encouraging us to uh, seek some kind of position, to do something, we should examine, is this really for 
ourself or is this really for a greater good? Is this really correct for us to do? Will this really help all our people around us? Will this really be of benefit to our family, to everybody? So really what, he, uh, what he's talking about is actually very practical in our lives, applies to our everyday lives. So non-attachment is a fundamental pr principle. No form as our substance. No form means not to be attached to objects when we are in contact with them. And then no thinking to keep our mind free from all defilements under all circumstances. So no thinking is usually difficult for people to understand. What do we mean when we say no thinking? What? How can you not think? Many people have looked at me when I said, don't think about it, no thinking. But people usually thinking is nonstop. So what we talk about in Zen, we say the mind which is before thinking, the intuitive mind. We call that the don't know mind. The don't know mind is before any thoughts arise. When you saw what I just did, I hold up the stick. When you heard that sound, were you thinking? Were you not thinking? Maybe for a split second you wondered, what's he doing? Why he hold up the stick? Why did he make that sound? That moment, we say, is before thinking. Before we discriminate. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it right? Is it wrong? So when I just held up the stick, the time, there's a already not yet judgment. That moment that it hit, you hear the sound, you see something, it's before you start to judge. But afterwards, we start to think. We start to judge. We start to wonder what's happening. So this before thinking moment is very important. Before we have the judgment. Is this good or bad? Is this right or wrong? Before that, we call that the before thinking. And the Sixth Patriarch calls that no thinking. No thinking to keep our mind free from all defilements under all circumstances. In our modern day language, we call that the before thinking don't know mind, the mind of not knowing. That's before you judged, before you check something, before you judge, before you check. There's only that sound. There's only that visual of the stick being raised. This is what we call the before thinking, the don't know mind. And the Sixth Patriarch talked about that as a non-thinking. So he said, it has been the tradition of our school to take no thinking before thinking as our teaching, no form as our substance, and non-attachment as our fundamental principle. No thinking means not attaching to any thinking which arises in our mind. It's straight out of the Diamond Sutra. Don't attach to anything which arises in the mind. For those of you who understand Chinese, <laughs> that means don't attach to anything that arises. Don't even attach to the mind. Don't attach to the voice of the speaker also. Just be aware. Just awake. So, all things, whether good or bad, beautiful or ugly, should be treated as empty. Even when there are disputes and quarrels, we should treat our friends and enemies alike and never think of retaliation. That's very difficult. It's easier said than done. In our thinking, let the past be dead. If we allow our thoughts, past, present, and future, to link up in a series, we put ourselves under restraint. On the other hand, if we never let our mind attach to anything, we shall gain emancipation. For this reason, we take non-attachment as our fundamental principle. So how do we remain unattached? How do we not become attached to things? Very important is that we not invest in our own thinking. This is one of the most fund the most basic things that we teach in our Zen school. 
that we not invest in our thinking. We don't believe every thought that creeps into our mind. That we're able to see some thoughts as being useless or see some thoughts as being uh, foolish and be able to see others as being worthwhile, as being a wise thought. Maybe the thought that frees us from thinking is the wise thought. But only with ex experience can we actually do this. And that experience comes when we practice together with a, uh, especially together in a community, but if we practice together with other people, we have that experience. Even if you come here to the library and you read the books and you sit with other people, you will have a chance to experience that. Ah, I have some moment of kind of foolish thinking. Ah, I have some moment of productive thinking. We all have that experience. So it says to free ourselves from attachment from external to external objects is called no form. When we do this, the nature of the Dharma will be pure. For this reason, we take no form as our substance. What does it mean, our substance? Everybody has substance. Your substance, my substance, the dog's substance, the cat's substance, each one is uniquely different. Your substance, my substance, cat, dog, the tree, the sky substance, each one is uniquely different. The stick's substance, the book's substance, but we all have the same substance. So how can we all be uniquely different and yet the same at the same time? We all share this thing we call substance, but we all in some ways are unique and uniquely different. That's because we all have our own unique way of thinking. If we go to the place of before thinking, before thought arises, before opposites discrimination, we are not so different. We actually share the same substance. We find that we have the same things in common. We may have many things that are not in common, but there's one thread which is in common. We call that our original substance, before thinking. Our substance before any thought arises. So this form, this thing that we call form, is after thinking arises. Academics is also after thinking arises. We all understand that the form of, uh, let's say, a Western person like my face, the, my, like myself, the face of a Western people, the form is different than the form of an Asian person. The nose is bigger, more pronounced. The skin, is color is different. Many things different. This is the form. But when we attach to this form, we forget that we have the same substance. Once we attach to this form, we soon start to think in terms of he's a, uh, he's a white person, he's a yellow person, he's a black, he's a, from Africa. All this kind of discriminations appear. And if we continue to discriminate and continue to separate, soon we think about how many black people, how many white people, how many Asian people are they really fully dark? Are they really fully white? We go through all kinds of thinking, on and on, like that. We lose the position, we forget where we all share the same original substance, which means the same before thinking mind. We all have the same before thinking mind. If suddenly you hear a loud uh, sound in this room, like a siren, if suddenly there's a fire and there's a loud siren, we all have the same thought. What happened? Let's get out. Well, let's get out of the building. We all want to run out of the building or we all want to uh, somehow not get hurt because we all have the same original substance, the same original this of mind. But our discrimination and attachment to form separates us and divides us and leads us to scheme and do many things like that. So actually when we look at this teaching, we see that uh, the sixth patriarch, he was really only talking about one thing. He's not talking about two different things, three or 
two or three different things. When he talks about non-attachment, he's also talking non non-attachment, the form, and the non-thinking, and no opposites thinking, no elusive thinking. He says all these things divide us. Of course, how can you live your life walking around? I'm not going to think today. Oh, I'm not going to be attached to form. Oh, I have no form. I'm not a man. I'm not a woman. I am not, not this. I am not that. I'm not going to do this. You probably go crazy, right? So, if you've only attached to his words, you also have problem. Okay. So, he also understood that. So he said to his uh, audience, he said, some teachers of meditation. They teach their students to observe their mind, blah, blah, blah. And he said, deluded people attach to this style and become crazy. If you attach to the teaching itself, you also become crazy. But he goes on to say here on page 184, he says, let me explain more fully why we take not, no thinking as our teaching. And he goes on to talk about what is the true meaning of no thinking. And he said no means no opposites thinking or no elusive thinking. So no thinking doesn't mean just not thinking. Actually, if you force yourself, maybe you grind your teeth together. I'm not going to think. Maybe you have a big problem. Maybe, maybe you, even if you succeed in not thinking at all, maybe you Maybe you burn yourself, you know, like actually uh, some monks, when they were in great distress, they burned themselves to death. But it's also in the teaching of the Zen school, it's not considered the best way. Because even if you force yourself not to think, force yourself to endure unbearable pain and you die, there's a good chance again you'll be reborn into a thinking person. So, rather than try to force ourselves to not think, we must find that which is before thought arises. We call this the substance. Or, as I say in many times to Zen Center people, I say the don't know mind. The mind that doesn't know. We call it the don't know mind. So, we should fix our mind on the true nature of tathata. For tathata is the substance of thinking, and thinking is the function of tathata. What is tathata? Anybody know that word? Nobody know? Suchness. Correct. Suchness. Wow. We have a scholar and a gentleman here. OK. <laughs> tathata means suchness. Now, suchness, well, what's suchness? It's not easy to describe, but it's that which, which is. That what is. That, we say, for example, the wall is white. It's 10 minutes after 3 on the clock. We call that the suchness of the wall. If we just see the wall's white 10 minutes after 3, we experience the tathata of the wall and the clock. But as soon as we start to think about it, oh, it's getting kind of late. I better get home to my children. I better see my wife. I better do my job, blah, blah, blah. Tomorrow I have to work. As soon as we start to think like that, we lose the tathata of it. We lose the tathata of it. So the famous Koreans and Master Song Chol Sinim said many times, after all practicing, after the mountain becomes water, the water becomes mountain. After there's no mountain, there's no water. Finally, mountain is just mountain. Water is just water. This is the same point. Tathata, the suchness of things. Tathagata. Zen is a kind of Zen that, that they teach in Japan, actually. Tathagata Zen. Tathata Zen. I met a great master in America, uh, Roshi Sasaki Roshi, a Japanese uh, uh, Zen master who lives in the Los Angeles. And he's a, uh, really uh, quite an old uh, master. He's 90, over 90 years old now. 
And his teaching was that of Tathagata Zen, Tathata Zen, the Zen of the suchness, that things are just as they are. They are already the Buddha. That if you want to see the Buddha right now, just see the white wall. If you want to see the Buddha, just go home and look at your mother, look at your children. Though they are already the Buddha. They are already the complete Tathata. They have the suchness. Of course, many people have an idea the Buddha should be in a certain form. And my children, why are they screaming? Why are they not behaving like the Buddha? But this is just people's idea. Actually, things as they are. The suchness of things, we call that Tathata. Oh, this is a fundamental point. So, it's the nature of Tathata itself, not the sense organs which give rise to thinking. So Tathata gives birth to its own attributes and therefore can give rise to thinking. And that's in quotes, quotation mark. Without Tathata, the sense organs and the sense objects would perish immediately. Learned audience, because it is the essential nature of Tathata, which give rise to thinking our sense organs, in spite of their functions in seeing, hearing, to touching, knowing, need not be tainted or defiled by circumstances. Then our true nature will be free all the time. So the sutra says, a person who has attained the nature of Tathata will be able to understand the nature of all dharmas while remaining unmoved. Okay, so that means without uh, moving, without changing anything at all, we can understand the nature of all things, the nature of all dharmas. Wow, sounds difficult, doesn't it? But 10,000 things or 10,000 dharmas return to the one. Where does the one return to? This is a famous question in Korean Buddhism and also in the Zen school. In Korean, uh, Chinese said, Man bop gui il, il gui hachol. Man bop gui il, il gui hachol. 10,000 things return to the one. Where does that one return? And we can say that one, it's not mind, it's not Buddha. What is it? Of course, the six patriarch may have called it mind, but we don't want to get attached to mind either. So if it's not mind, if it's not Buddha, what is it that the, ten, that the one returns to? And if we uh, want to put a name on it, we can call that suchness or tathata. But actually, it's a shame to put a name on it. Better is to leave it as a question, to leave it as a don't know, as a question mark. Then we can discover it for ourselves right in this moment. We can discover it right as we live. Any questions? No questions. I must be doing my job too well. Yes? Mm, many people, yeah, they have to do something like grab a moktak, hit the moktak, bum, 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 bum you know, and do chanting something, or hit the bell, you know, or drumming, 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 you know. And if they are, keep their mind occupied, then it's possible for them to have a little experience of the clear mind. But actually, this is not the complete clear mind. This is only very temporary. This is just a temporary experience. It soon goes away. Sometimes, uh, it's like this, when the young man and the young woman really, you know, first time fall in love. And the first kiss, it's like a magic. Wow. It's like, like they, they're going to a you know, special place. Is this the clear mind? But it's soon gone. Soon the magic is gone. Soon it's not so magical. But that first time is very magical. But soon, it's uh, disappeared. So the true clear mind means not attached to even the good things. Of course, we don't want to attach to bad things. It's worse to be attached to bad things. But 
we cannot attach to good things either. If we attach to good things, then we only can be clear when we're busy. Because we always want to hold these good things. We always try to hold these good things in our life. We only want the good in our life and avoid the bad. But if we accept the good and the bad, they both come together. They are not separate. Like many Korean people nowadays, if you go to Korean bookstore, what kind of book do you see the most? Many of you are Koreans. And it's not different in, Amer in America, too. The book that you see the most nowadays is How to Get Rich, How to Become Buja. This is the most book you see in Korea nowadays. How to do real estate, how to do economics, how to become rich. Many people are reading book. How can I become rich? But actually, if you want rich, you have to also understand what is being poor. What is poverty? You cannot have one and not have the other. They come together. Okay? So we cannot, if we really want to practice the deep samadhi, if we really want to understand the, the uh, meditation, we cannot attach to things, relative things, like becoming rich or, or you know, becoming famous. These things are relative. They are only temporary. But we all attach. Many people want good things, want to avoid bad things, want to have an easier life, not difficult life, hoping for that, hoping for easy life with good things, with good friends. But someday you meet the friend who's not so good. Someday you meet the bad friend. What do you do? Run away? You run away from the bad friend? <laughs> so our Buddhist teaching is if we don't attach, we meet everything just as it is. We meet people just where they are. We don't try to change them. We meet them just where they are. And we first find out what the truth is just that moment. We call that the suchness of them. Same substance. Okay? So in order to do that, it's necessary for us to have a, a, mo, a, a kind of a, like a clear background, some clear, white, neutral background. You know, we have a, like a neutral card. If you are doing like some kind of artwork or photography, they have neutral gray, gray card, neutral gray, you know, gray background like this and with a neutral gray background you can uh, balance all the other colors it's a photography they use this gray card or white balance sometimes white balance those of you who know you know digital photography they do have the white balance is similar to that we have to have something in our life that's neutral that's not we don't get attached to. What can we have in our life that we don't get attached to? And we call that before thinking or don't know mind. So I always teach students of meditation, you must, even if it's difficult, you must ask the big question, what is this? What am I? Then the don't know mind appears. Then by keeping the don't know, you become clear by itself. <laughs>